Cool. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here this morning. So I thought I would start by just... Um, it's not working anymore. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> Hello? Okay, I'll do with that. That's fine. Um, so, again, I thought I would start... And it's not working neither. Wow. All right, let me try something. And then again. And then maybe that then. Yes, all right, cool. So uh, I want to share the link to the slides, um, just because if you want to follow along, if I'm going too fast or if something is too small, I tried to use the biggest uh, font size I could fit and uh, write color contrast, but I might have missed something. So if you want to follow along, uh, this is the short link. Uh, I tried to like, make it pretty simple. But so let's move on to the actual topic. So I want to start with a pretty simple slide. I would assume that if you're here, you kind of know what these represent. But just in case, on the left, you have a laptop. And on the right, you have a mobile phone. And the reason why I started with that is because I want to talk about interaction. I find that very weird that um, you have the internet, which is like this giant network where you can access information anywhere uh, by almost anybody. And we decide to interact with it in like a small screen that's like our phone or, or, or our laptop. And the way we interact with it is that we had to learn these new gestures like swiping and, and like tap it up on your, you know, on your keyboard. And, and it became part of what we do. Uh, and we accepted it. And personally, I don't really believe in the keyboard uh, like that being around for that much longer. I think that there's probably other types of interaction that are a lot more natural. Uh, that we should focus on. And this is what I like to do on my personal time. So by day, I'm a software dev, so I probably work on the same type of stuff uh, as you do, just like websites or apps. And, but on my personal time, I like to explore um, alternative inter interactions. Um, so I like to kind of play around with technology and see how I can uh, interact with stuff outside of the typical keyboard and phone. So let's talk about these uh, interactive technologies. So when you, especially the new stuff, you can start with the wearables. Some of you probably even are wearing a Fitbit. And if you think about the dashboard that you get, yes, you have to interact with it uh, later on on your phone or on your laptop. But the whole tracking of your steps is done quite free. Like you can move around and it will count. You don't actually have to hold your phone and say like you know one step, two step, three steps. Um, it's kind of it's free. It kind of does it, and you don't have to think about it. Uh, and then you have also voice UIs. Some of you probably have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or maybe any other device that I don't know about. But same thing, it's kind of, it's a lot more free. You can move around your house and you just have to say a certain comment and you can access information without having to be especially in front of a laptop or having to take your phone uh, out of your pocket. And I think that's quite powerful. Maybe it doesn't work, you know, as well right now, but I think it's really important to be working on that kind of interactions. Uh, motion. Some of you might be working in offices where you can just walk around and the lights turn on. And same thing, like uh, if nobody is in the office after a certain time, the lights turn off and you don't have to think about it. It's all around us, but it's kind of like disappearing. Um, this one is quite funny, like facial recognition and computer vision. Uh, I didn't know that, but in China, you can pay at KFC with your face. Uh, I find that quite interesting because I can't even imagine the interaction that you go to the shop and it's kind of like, hi, would you like to pay by card, cash, or face today? Well, I'll pay by face, thank you. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's, I mean, I don't really want to pay with my face, but they're already doing it. So maybe, you know, in a few years, we'll all have to do it. And the one I, I want to focus on today is biofeedback. So uh, biofeedback is just um, having the data coming, uh, like, getting data of physiological functions using devices that track the activity of different systems in the body. And um, especially, I'm working with the Emotive Epoch, which is uh, a brain sensor. And before talking about how the sensor or the device actually works, uh, I thought we should go back to how the brain actually works. So I'm not a neuroscientist, so I can't explain in depth how the brain actually works. And I don't think we really, really know. But I'm going to do like a very high level and very brief intro so that we can understand what's going on afterwards. So you start with a subject, could be anybody, and with an intent of doing something. And it triggers a certain part of the brain. Uh, and different parts of the brain are in control of different um, activities. And then, the, for example, you want, let's say you want to walk. So you don't think about walking, you just kind of do. So you have a trigger in, I think, actions are in the prefrontal cortex, but I, I don't actually remember exactly. So, uh, but then the, this part of the brain is going to send a signal to a body part. So that's a ham. 
because I was looking for an icon of legs, and it's either strong men legs or a sexy woman legs. And I was like, fuck this, I'll just get it ham. That's the same thing, <laughs> and it's gender neutral, and it's... <laughs> And yeah, so and then so the, the part of the brain that's uh, responsible for uh, actions of walking send a signal to your little hams and you end up walking like that ends up uh, being an action. So all it does is basically just signals from the brain to the rest of the body. And so now how does the emotive work? So it has 14 different sensors. Um, and on the left, you have where these uh, channels are placed around the head. And in the middle, you have how a more, um, kind of say, high level, like high um, definition uh, brain sensor works. And in green and orange, you have where the emotive is placed around that. So they kind of try to cover a broad range of the face uh, on, the, on the head, but without having to have too many uh, sensors. And when I got um, this brain sensor, I, of course, I wanted to play with it. But the only thing available was an SDK in uh, C++ and Java. Uh, I, um, I learned Ruby and JavaScript, so I was a bit like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. Um, but I didn't want to give up. Like, that's a piece of uh, device that's quite, you know, can be a bit uh, expensive. It's a lot cheaper than something that you find in hospitals, but it's still uh, like a bit of money. So I didn't want to give up. And so I decided to try and build something in JavaScript to allow other JavaScript devs to not go through the struggle that I went through and just being able to buy the device and use JavaScript with it. So I built um, Epoch.js. Uh, that's basically a JavaScript framework that allows you to interact with the data coming from the brain sensor uh, in JavaScript. And so the features. So when you get this uh, sensor, you can download uh, what's called the uh, composer, which is an emulator. So you don't have to actually set up the sensor all the time. You don't have to carry it around. It can be a bit fragile. <clears throat> so you can actually open the emulator, write your program. And if, it, if you can send actions from the emulator to your program and it does what you want, then you're sweet. Uh, it's working. But you can also have access to the live data. So the, the device has a gyroscope and accelerometer, so you can get the head movements. You can get performance metrics, so you can get your level of focus, excitement, attention, stress. Uh, you can also get facial expressions with the sensors around uh, the like, front of the face. So for example, smiling or looking right, looking left, up, down, uh, and a few others. But the most exciting part is that you can get some mental comments. So they have to be related to a thought of action. And I would assume, but I'm not sure, that it's because it's easier to recognize as a pattern than uh, thinking about a chair or something like that. When you think about an action, I think the, the signals that come from the brain are easier to recognize um, like in different people than uh, thinking about the beach. Uh, in terms of text stack, so I had to use the C++ SDK in the background, uh, probably very badly written, but it works. Uh, and then I created what we called a Node.js add-on, and I used um, these three modules there. So now I know that there's a new way to create a Node.js add-on that I think is called NAPI, but uh, at the time when I started, it, it wasn't there. Uh, so I haven't updated it, but for now it works, so when I get time, I'll probably try to like, move over. Oh, no. Uh, OK. I th oh, my god. All right, so demo time. Uh, I always like to start my demos with a little reminder that um, it might not work. I, it's, it's supposed to work. Uh, it was working a few days ago. But uh, yeah. All right, so I was already nervous, but it's even worse. <laughs> So uh, the first thing that I built is a brain keyboard. So it's just an interface of, well, a keyboard. And uh, I wanted to be able to interact with it just by um, moving my eyes. So this demo is not related to thoughts. It's just um, like facial actions and stuff. So one, like, before I start, so the little bit annoying thing with the sensor is that you have to uh, put some kind of gel on all of them to conduct properly. So I did it before the talk to make sure that I'll be fine, but I'll just redo it quickly, because uh, it's better if it's well connected. Uh, it's not that much of a pain, but it's just a little bit. Uh, all right, I should be all right. And OK, so uh, the thing is, you do look stupid when you wear it, so just get used to it. Um, 
All right, so as it's a demo, you might want to take a picture, which is fine. And I forgot, I don't know if I turn it on or off. OK, I don't know. Uh, so you might want to take a picture, which is fine. Just make sure my eyes are open, because I already look stupid. So if my eyes are closed on top of that, I'd be like, so don't take a picture. I heard, don't take a picture when my eyes are closed. Please, like that's already quite hard. Um, so, OK, so I'm here. And then I have, OK, let me check something first. I want to check if it's green everywhere. So I have to launch uh, another, of, another one of their program. Oh, I'm missing one here. Yes, oh, hello. Oh, it was, wait, was it on? So I did turn it on. That's interesting. Uh, OK, so that's not great, but it, let's, it should be all right. Let's try. So I have uh, my server, and I just have, oop, no Optus. Um, OK, so if I look right, yes, and I blink, blink, it doesn't get a blink. So I look right, and oh, I did look left, OK. Right, blink, left, oh, damn. All right, OK, let me try a bit more. Is it? Oh, well, I did blink, but yes, OK. So right, OK. Blink, 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 blink. No? <laughs> oh, OK. Well, that's working really well, doesn't it? Um, what? Damn. <sighs> I knew it. It's letting me down all the time. Uh, why are you? I know I'm moving my. Well, now you want to work. All right, so, well, that's the point. I'm supposed to be working fine, but it doesn't. So I'm going to move on to the other demo then, and hopefully this one is actually going to work a bit better. Probably not. But so the, the other demo that I built, uh, so the aim at the end is to have uh, mind control in WebVR. So I'm aware that's not totally WebVR. It's just uh, 3D in the browser. But that's, as I'm pretty sure, that it's going to let me down. I just recorded something so that I have the proof that it actually does work. Uh, so the, I, for now, I just trained the thoughts of uh, thinking about the direction right, left, pushing, and pulling. So I'll try and kind of like go uh, back and forth. Uh, so let's see. The thing as well is that you have to focus quite a lot. Uh, and my state, oh, I need to close up that one. Yeah, it was still tracking. Uh, and my, uh, yeah, the state of mind I'm in right now is I'm not really, I'm thinking about other stuff. I'm thinking about, I'm like nervous. Okay, so server again. And then again, I'll go to localhost. Man, yes, okay. Yeah, okay. Eh. Go back. Man, I'm struggling. It doesn't want to go right, but that's fine. <laughs> Let me try again. I'll try again. I'll try again. Let me try. Uh, okay. Maybe I need to. Ah, I'm missing some in the middle. Okay. I don't have time to redo it. Um, all right. I really want to go right. OK. Yeah, OK. Whoa, I went right. All right. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> Whew. Well, all right. Uh, so I'm going to take that off because uh, well, and now I have gel all over my hair. This is great. Forget about having a cool haircut. Um, all right, so what is next? OK, code samples. Um, just to show you very quickly how it works, this is a very, very short code sample. There's more lines than that. I try to make it uh, quite big. Um, so if we start from, just take it as pseudocode, because there's a lot of code missing. So it's just about understanding uh, the process of like the Node.js module. So at the bottom, you want to create a module that we're going to call a module. And its entry point is going to be uh, the init function. And the init function is right here. And we're going to create a, a function that we want to be able to uh, have access to in JavaScript that we call, that I called um, connect to emo composer. And so that when we require the module in JavaScript, we're just going to be able to call that um, to start the whole thing. And what this uh, method is going to do is that it's actually going to be um, connected to our connect function that's here. And what this one does, uh, and this is where you use the C++ SDK, is you start by creating an emo state handle that's going to be handling the data coming from the brain sensor. 
Uh, and you use, you use that handle to check if what kind of expressions you get or what kind of thought you get. So for example, if you want to know if you're blinking, it comes back as an integer 0 or 1. So you keep checking, and, um, and then we just have like a, an object that I call event. And we have a property, we, like I add a property uh, blink on the event object, and the value of it is going to be the integer coming back from checking if I'm blinking or not. So yeah very poorly written. I don't actually know if it's poorly written or not, because I don't do C++, but it works. So that's fine for me. Uh, and then, so this is like the C++ file. And then you have the uh, binding.jip file. And same, that's a really short sample. There's a bit more. But basically what it does is that you take the, your C++ file as the source file, and you say that the, the target name is module, because it comes from my um, C++ file. I just wanted to call it module. Then you build that up, you compile. And in JavaScript, you can require that module. And then we have access to uh, connect to emo uh, composer. And then we get our object with the data coming back. And I also have a connect to live data function where you, pa you uh, put in the path to the file where you are uh, recorded your brain patterns. And basically, when you run the program, you have access to this object with the properties blinking, looking right, or looking left, or whatever you want. So very quickly, this is how um, it actually works. And in the end, I, I'm just like, it's actually not that bad. It took me a while to figure it out, because not knowing C++, it was, uh, it was very hard to even like, know where I was going. Uh, but in the end, I got there. Uh, it definitely needs to be <laughs> refactored. But I did refactor it a few times. Um, I remember once I realized I had two files of a few hundred lines, and they were actually doing exactly the same thing. Uh, so I could delete everything. I felt so productive. It was awesome. So the limits. Of course, you need training for each user, not for the facial expressions, but for the mental comments, which in a way is a good thing, because otherwise it means we would be exactly all the same. But it means that when, uh, when a user um, try, like, tries it for the first time, you do have to train it before being able to use it. You can't track everything. Uh, that kind of like makes sense to me, but sometimes you see people complaining about like, oh, it's not good enough. It doesn't know what I want. And it's like, it's a brain sensor that you can just buy online. It already has like around 15 actions that you can track. Like, what else do you want? Um, and latency. So as you have to focus, and as it has to like to check all the time um, the difference between your current brain waves and the patterns that it knows, uh, you do have a bit of a, a delay between like your, your thinking and your focusing, and then it detects it. So depending on what you would like, want to build with it, it might not be the right thing. If you want to build like a controlled car, you might not want to use that. Um, but there's also limits in terms of user experience. Uh, I think the tech is actually quite cool, but as users, we like to have a seamless interaction. We like to be able to use technology, and we want technology to do whatever we want without having to even think about it. So there's a bit of a limit in terms of how we are building technology right now. You, like a lot of the times, we build innovation, and we think about it from a dev point of view. Like, oh my god, this innovation is amazing. But it actually doesn't, like people don't want to use it. Like it, it won't work. Uh, we have trust issues with technology. Uh, we, when a new product comes in, we're super excited. and. We use it, but then it fails once, and that's over, and we don't use it anymore, um, which is also interesting. And if you want to develop products like that, you also have to think about that. I think as users, we should probably be a bit more like nice to tech, because you have to remember that we build it. It's not this magical thing that you just buy and it works. And real value. So when, if you would want people to actually use new interactions and stuff like the brain sensor, you really have to find a way to make it like to, to make it bring value. Uh, we kind of like, we have habits, and we like to use these habits because we don't have to think. So you have to make sure that what you're building is actually good enough for people to want to switch. For example, if this, even if this brain sensor was like super powerful and it worked really well, I'm not sure I would walk around with that on. Uh, I mean, instead of like social acceptance, it's not, it doesn't really work. Uh, but that's not just like the three points that I could think about, but I'm sure there's more because I was kind of like researching interactions and technology, and this TED talk is really cool because it's so um, this person, this student from MIT built a device where you had a camera and a projector and you could walk around and have things projected on your environment rather than having to take to your phone or your iPad and things like that. So you could point to a newspaper and have videos, you know, as if like you were in Harry Potter or uh, stuff like that. And you could make a gesture like this, and it would recognize it and take a picture for you, which I thought the, cool was, like, the tech was really cool, and it worked quite well in the demo, at least. But then I scrolled down, and I saw that it was made 10 years ago. And I was surprised that I'm just like, so now, like 10 years ago, 
So we've, like, you know, 10 years have passed, and we have nothing close to that. We are still using the exact same thing, and I find that quite crazy. And at the end of the talk, um, the speaker actually said, oh, we never know, maybe in 10 years we'll come back and we'll talk about the ultimate brain implant. And we are now 10 years, you know, and we're not there at all. Uh, so that's quite interesting. It's kind of like you have to figure out why exactly are we not there. Uh, and I think that we are working so hard on making the tech good that we forget to think about the user. I think we need to think about, like, we need to think more about people. Possibilities. Um, accessibility, of course. Um, my demo is, is like small, but I think it could still be useful to some people. You have people working on trying to uh, control a, a wheelchair with that sensor. I think that's just like a uni project, but that's still pretty cool. Uh, mental health. Uh, the MOTV POC is not the only brain sensor. There's a few others, and they, they have less um, sensors, and they usually focus on trying to make you deal with uh, stress and attention a bit better. So I think that's a cool space to also um, have that uh, as a like, useful thing. And art. So that's my favorite, so I had to put it in there. Uh, I like mixing technology and art because you can explore things that you don't get to do uh, at work. And it might seem useless for some people, but I would like to remind everybody that useless is not worthless. A lot of the things that I do are useless. Um, but I learned so much from doing it, and I learned stuff that I can apply on other projects. And I, I even, like, when I started with the brain sensor, I didn't want to do a brain keyboard. I was just thinking, oh, would it be cool if I could have some graphics with my brain? And, and then it ended up being something that could be useful, and I, and I learned a lot. So, yes, useless is definitely not worthless. Uh, I just wanted to quickly um, show uh, something else that I didn't build, but that I thought would be like even the next step that's even more uh, incredible. I don't know if you have heard of Project um, Alter Ego, so that's also MIT Media Lab. And this device can actually track internal speech and translate into words. So you know when you talk to yourself in your head, so you, you create the words, like I can hear myself talk in my head, but they managed to, they managed to kind of sense the electrical signals that happen in your jaw when you think about speaking, and to translate that into words. And there's an interview where uh, this student could Google things and answer questions by just kind of like thinking about the words. So of course, I'm sure they polished that demo for the interview. But um, it's like, it's amazing. And I'm just like, well, you know, it's like probably it's like electrodes or whatever. I have electrodes at home. Maybe I could just try it. So maybe I'll try, uh, but we'll see. And I just wanted to show quickly something funny. It's like the first prototype of Alter Ego was that. And it just reminded me of an emotive epoch, but upside down. And I was like, well, maybe I'm sweet. I can just use that, you know? Um, and so I just have a few links. I'm getting to the end of uh, my talk, but I have a few links if you want to have a look. There's probably a bit more that I can add in there. But if you are interested in neurotechnology, there's actually a Slack channel that's global where people talk about that. Uh, and I wanted to finish on that point. Um, you know when sometimes you look at a piece of art and you're like, what the fuck, I could have made this. And this is exactly how I want you to feel about that talk. Because when you think about the tech, all I did is write some you know, very bad C++, and then I wrapped it up into a Node.js add-on. And the innovative piece of tech is actually the, the sensor. Like, I didn't make it, I just bought it. And if I can do that, I can assure you that anybody here um, can do that. All you need to do is to maybe take a step back and not try to think about making something useful straight away. Just like you know, have fun, you know, like release your inner child, like don't be scared of just trying and building something. And I can assure you that you're, you're gonna have a lot of fun doing this. Um, so this is the uh, end of my talk. Um, I am DevDevCharlie on Twitter. You can, uh, of course, always come and talk to me if you want, I'll be walking around. Uh, and if you have any questions, no worries. Unfortunately, I have to leave the conference uh, this afternoon because I have uh, to take a flight or flights back to Australia. Uh, I have to speak at another conference, so I won't be there tonight, but I think I'll leave maybe around three, so um, I'll be walking around if you have any question. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and thanks so much, JSCon, for you for having me.